we this is my my first slide so if we want to to see in a snapshot uh, about the sustainable development in the future or in the incoming future my my view is that uh, uh, the picture here uh, represents what we should do or what we should uh, have in our uh, mindset uh, we have to save ourselves and we have to save the nature so this is the issue that uh, in in many parts of the world that uh, we are now struggling uh, can we go to the next slide please okay uh, uh, this is my, my my favorite quote quote for uh, the sustainable development uh, from uh, Jerome Powell. Uh, he is still the the Fed Reserve Chairman of uh, the U.S. Uh, what he said that uh, we are not going back to the same economy after the pandemic. So uh, it's very hard to for us for all of us uh, to go back to the same economy. Uh, it is a very uh, thoughtful and uh, very uh, provoking uh, understanding that uh, the economy itself uh, might change and uh, the the way we we do business the way we do our life uh, will uh, eventually or will gradually uh, change and we just realized that uh, for the recent pandemic that the, the nature has been acting in balance uh, many Many parts of the world, including when I attended the Said uh, Business School uh, environmental program, that they said it is it is very uh, very important for the business uh, community for the business world uh, to push forward to work uh, together with the scientists as well as with the government institutions to make uh, the environment, the climate change uh, is manageable. Uh, as we all understand that we have uh, the goal for 1.5 degrees Celsius increase until 2000. Is it possible or not? It depends on uh, how we perceive the situation at the moment. I always uh, said that, uh, where should we start? In my opinion, we should start by our mindset. Thinking uh, the clear picture, thinking the for the future generation and thinking for the incoming uh, children that we are going to have or we have at the moment. Uh, I will uh, share with you some slides, uh, some snapshots of the thought that uh, why the world uh, is changing rapidly towards the better living condition. Next, please. Okay. Uh, this is a very favorite and very uh, popular uh, slide that uh, we've been uh, seeing uh, in, in many places or in, in many conference or in many uh, academic discussion, as well as the, the government institutions, uh, events and so on. Uh, this, this three uh, cylinders uh, represent what we should have, the ESG. When I started to have my career in the mid eighties, what I understand is just the blue cylinder the governance. I never uh, learned about the, the pink cylinder or the green cylinder. For, for me, uh, in my experience, if, if any institutions or if any uh, uh, companies or any uh, government or any uh, uh, group that are not uh, comply or they are not uh, good in governance, I don't think they are also can manage the social issue and also the environmental issue. Uh, for Indonesia, 
uh, for or in many uh, developing countries that governance is still an issue. So it's been introduced uh, since 1970s, how we put our governance in place from the corporate governance into the corruption and instability issue into the bias diversity at the board diversity and business ethics. Then uh, by late uh, 90s, the world introduced another cylinder, which is what we call the social. So that's why we have human rights, we have supply chain standards, we have labor management, health and safety, human capital development, and so on. So Indonesia uh, and uh, many parts of the emerging Asian uh, countries in the late 80s uh, faced uh, the big transformation of their political platform. Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and so on and so forth. So we are we've been adopting the social issues for, for I think is so far is almost uh, a quarter century, but it has not been completed yet uh, here and there. So the imbalance uh, uh, parameters and the imbalance practice and so on. Now we are facing for another cylinder, which we call the environmental. Uh, climate change, uh, natural resources, pollution and waste and biodiversity, in my opinion, are mandatory in our way of life, in our way of doing business or in our way of doing activities. Uh, it's, as I said, uh, in many times that for the academics and for the government institutions, they are tend to deliver this three cylinders or especially the environmental issues uh, very perfectly. Yeah. In, but the issue is not that we need to deliver this uh, environmental issue perfectly in the in the any academic forum or in the any academic uh, discussion and so on. But the issue is the mindset, the way the action that needed to implement the climate change. I'll give you an example. Uh, I've been in the, uh, on the board of uh, Unilever since 2020, uh, after I finished my uh, public job. Then uh, why, people ask me why I'm, I accept the, the offer from Unilever. The first one that I said that uh, Unilever uh, globally, including in Indonesia, committed to reduce or to fight the climate change. So what is the proof? The proof is that Unilever Indonesia operations anywhere from their factory in Medan or in Jakarta or in Surabaya, we at Unilever use 100%, 100% the electricity from the green resources. So we only purchase the electricity from PLN, from National Electricity Company, only from the environmentally friendly natural resor uh, resources. Why? This is the issue. We don't we don't buy the the power from PLN from the Called or from thermal uh, generator or from a gas generator or, or and so on. No, we buy the power from the hydro, the big hydro dam uh, that produces the electricity in the northern Sumatra or in West Java or in East Java. So that's it. Do we have to pay higher cost? Yes. We pay so far around 30% higher than the average industry in Indonesia, but we are committed. This is what I want to deliver, that the action is very, very important. On the natural resources, we have, we have abolished using animals for the testing activities. We also try to reduce the extractions of the natural resources as much as possible. So what is the proof? The proof is that all of the Unilever products that are using the basic palm oil 
ingredients can only be obtained from the palm oil company that are comply with the RSPO, Roundtable Palm Oil Standard. So this is the big issue. We do not purchase any palm oil a product without any international certification standard. So this is also another issue. Pollution and waste is the same. Uh, Unilever produce like a, more than 500 uh, waste uh, corner or waste banks or pollution uh, waste banks uh, at, uh, in many parts of Indonesia. And we committed that all the plastic packaging is 100% recyclable. This is very important. The bias diversity is also the same. So if you visited uh, many sites of Unilever in the in Indonesia and I, either the factory, the office, or the storage and so on, we try to comply that uh, we generate a good environment that do not ruin the biodiversity as much as we can. So this is the effort. And you, if you ask me, how, how much? Uh, the cost. The cost is around 20% higher than the competitor, but we're committed. If you look at the annual reports of Unilever, so uh, the cost itself compared to the competitor is unbearable. We are having, we are suffering from our market capitalization quite significantly for the past maybe two to three years. It is not because of the business itself shrinking, but it's because of the cost itself increasing because of the commitment on the environmental. Why this can happen? It's because the government has been in place. The social issues also has been in place at Unilever. So uh, in short, I would like to express my experience that if any institutions that are not good in governance or that are not good in social issues, I think it's very challenging for the institution to have very good reaction on the environmental issues. So that's my, my experience. Next, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is my uh, five key incoming industries that I aspire. They are coming uh, and coming in a bigger way. Number one is online business. Uh, last weekend, I shared the thing also in the school of uh, a postgraduate of University of Erlanga that uh, the online business, business is, is unavoidable. If we look at the traditional marketplace that are selling uh, not uh, so luxurious uh, things, I think they are reducing their operations. The many uh, malls or many uh, traditional marketplaces are closing now, globally. It's globally. People, especially for the younger generation, my kids, uh, they tend to purchase the things uh, through the online channel, which is good. So one, we reduce the energy for purchasing any things that we need because, well, the online business will reduce the activities, so the mall will reduce the electricity and so on and so forth. Number two is the renewable energy or renewable power. This is unavoidable. This is unavoidable. We are still combating, we are still debating about whether we have to change the, the renewable energy uh, in the power of uh, electricity or not, and so on. Let me tell you one thing. Indonesia has 75 gigawatts or 75,000 megawatts electricity in operations, majority operated by PLN or National Electricity Company. But if you look at China, China has around 1,350 gigawatts, almost 20 times that of Indonesian size in electricity. And China has so far more than 300 
gigawatts of the solar panel or solar uh, electricity system. And in total, including their hydro or wind power, they have around maybe close to 500 gigawatts. That of, I think is around seven times of the total electricity power in Indonesia. It's quite sad that we need to push. Well, when I was in the office, I did push very hard to, to initiate uh, that every institution should put the rooftop solar panel. This is very important. I talked to the leadership of uh, BLN recently. They said, so anybody can put the uh, rooftop solar panel. The issue is that they can use themselves, that, but they cannot use or they cannot try to sell it back to PLN uh, at the same time, but they can use. Let me tell you, my, my house that I live, that I'm currently conducting this uh, online uh, seminar, uh, has uh, like a, a 16 kVA, 16 uh, or 16,000 volt ampere uh, subscription from PLN. And also, I also put this at the same size of the rooftop solar panel. So I hope the people here, the 200, around 300 participants here. So just try to put your the solar panel in your residence. I have also uh, suggested uh, the presidents of Erlanga University to start putting the rooftop solar panel in the in the campus, in the buildings. So either in, in the new campus or in the old campus and so on, it will help. It will help significantly. This is very important. My, my house that I pay uh, the electricity bills around less than $100 because most of it served by the rooftop solar panel. This is very important. Number three is the electric vehicle, even though we understand that uh, the battery system at the moment is the intermediary technology. The end goal is for the hydro, for the hydrogen system that we will use for the elect for the fee for our vehicle. But it's a good start. It's a good start. Why not? If you don't want to purchase the 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 electric uh, car, so just purchase the electric motorcycle. It's, I think it's affordable. It's around one thousand five hundred dollars in a, in average. Just buy the electric vehicle. Do I have one? Yes, I have one. Oh, maybe I have two electric motorcycle. It's a good start, and it will go into that direction. It will go into that direction. Number four, artificial intelligence. We already all know that. Uh, this is my take for the artificial intelligence. Whatever can be done by the robots should not be done by the human beings in the near future. So we use the robots as the consistent quality for, the, for anything in our life. So human being should do other things, should preserve the life, should preserve the only, the only place that we live together, which is we call the world or earth. Number five, the environmental protections and revitalization. So, so that's why in many universities or many schools, they have a, uh, they have a program for the environmental protection or the env environmental revitalization and so on. This is very important. We've been damaging this world for so many years, especially uh, since the, the end of the World War II. So, if you count how big is the damage or the deforestation that we have done globally, including in Indonesia, since the end of the World War II, I think it's big. What I'm afraid is more than half. So my advice, uh, this can only be driven, I hope that our uh, academic colleagues also push forward this issue to the business world, to the real world, not only for the making the very beautiful uh, 
a Scopus standard papers, but we keep pushing to the real world to implement. Next, please. Uh, don't, please don't start first. This is a three-year-old video, I understand. I want you, all of you who haven't seen this video to understand that the climate change has to start with the mindset, then the next one with the action. Not just the mindset and then we just read the book or write the book. No, we have to do the actions. I, and I do hope the advanced countries, the rich countries, should support the initiative for many parts of the globe. Please, let's start. Do I have the voice, please? The Paris Agreement is now five years old. A lot has happened in that time, like the US joining and then leaving, and now we're on track to join again. There's also a pandemic, which set a lot of countries behind. But what is the agreement? Short answer, it's an attempt to stop catastrophic climate change. The agreement was adopted on December 12, 2015 and entered into force on November 4th, 2016. It was initially signed by 190 by 188 as of November 2020. But the core of the Paris Agreement is to limit the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that lead to global warming, so that the Earth's carbon sinks can keep pace and prevent the planet from overheating, all before the year 2100. That goal comes with the target of preventing the global average temperature from rising 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels this century. But why 2 degrees? Well, analysis have shown that if the global temperature rises beyond those 2 degrees, we could cross a tipping point and it may be impossible to recover from higher sea levels, disrupted weather patterns, and food and water insecurity issues. This could be the difference between life and death for thousands of people. At the current rate of global warming, the Earth could be 1.5 degrees warmer as soon as 2030. Now, the deal does not legally require any emission cuts from any of the countries involved. So it's basically all voluntary and there's no real punishment for missing country specific goals. Each country involved submitted their own plans on cutting emissions. So far, India is the only country in the G20 that it's on track to meet its initial promise back in 2015 and be compatible with a two degree warming goal. The top three emitters, China, the EU, and the US are nowhere near. As part of the agreement, all countries involved are supposed to review their contribution plans every five years. But unfortunately for the US, there's been little to no contribution after President Trump's 2017 decision to leave the Paris Agreement, which went into effect on November 4th, 2020. The US is now the first and only industrialized country to back out of the agreement. The only one. That being said, a new study predicts that by the end of the year, the US's greenhouse gas emissions will be 9% lower than they were in 2019, resulting in the lowest levels in three decades. But this drop in emissions is an odd silver lining from the pandemic, and not because of policy. And it could help Biden's administration get back on track to meeting the 2025 goal. President-elect Joe Biden also wants to opt back into the Paris Agreement as soon as he takes office on January 20, 2021, which means that the U.S. will have a lot of catching up to do and needs to be more aggressive to reduce emissions. Well, that and also regain the trust of allies. Despite the Paris Agreement's aggressive plan to curb climate change, it still received a lot of criticism from scientists and environmentalists. For starters, the two-degree mark is deemed as arbitrary or even too low. Some suggest we should aim to keep it down to 1.5 degrees if we truly want to avoid catastrophic events. Another aspect of the deal that's criticized is the pressure rich countries are putting on developing countries to leapfrog fossil fuels and move straight to renewable energy without much financial support or framework. Not to mention the fossil fuels they're now being shunned for using are exactly what made rich countries rich. And to top it all off, these developing countries are the ones who are impacted the most by climate change. But richer countries are doing their part. The agreement requires rich countries, like the US, before we left the agreement, to collectively provide $100 billion a year to help other countries adapt and help fight climate change. Obama, for example, pledged $3 billion to help other countries address climate change. But only $1 billion were delivered 
before Trump stops sending payments. As we mentioned in the beginning, the emission goals and financial commitments in the Paris Agreement are not legally binding. It's a bit of an honor system that we're all keeping an eye on. But what happens if countries miss their mark? Well, then it could all lose its steam. The good news is, there's a lot of energy behind advocacy to help fight climate change. So it's up to us and the court of public opinion to hold our governments and leaders accountable. If we don't do that, then we risk average global temperatures rising by 3 degrees Celsius by 2100. And well, that would put us well past catastrophic. Thank you for watching. Uh, well, <clears throat> let me share you as a comparison that uh, the commitment of the United States uh, for combating the global warming uh, was set at the $1 billion. Uh, is it that that's a lot of money, but if we read the publication, the official publications of how much the U.S. has contributed to the war in Ukraine, so far I think is more than two thousand billion U.S. So it's a serious amount of money. So, uh. So that's the comparison. That uh, my advice, we should act seriously on this. Not only just a mindset, then we should have a very thoughtful action in our own life. We start from ourselves. Next, please. Uh, thank you very much uh, for attending uh, my session.